welcome back to EDH Deck Building. I am your host, Demo, and it's time for another Magic Rules video. And I'm going to keep on doing this because you guys seem to like the videos, and I like answering people's questions. And at the start of all these videos, I'm going to grab some of the questions that people had from the previous video and see if I can answer them. So Dave Ingerson said, my question comes with Infernal Tribute. With it targeting a non-token card, does that mean it can target opponents? So let's look at Infernal Tribute again, and we have to look at the ratted text, of course, but in this case, it doesn't matter because it says sacrifice a non-token permanent, and you cannot sacrifice anything that isn't yours, right? That's the important part here. And why I wanted to cover this question, you can only sacrifice things that you control. You can't sacrifice your opponent's stuff. This is particularly important with grafted war gear if you want to put it in your Arden deck, which I originally thought, hey, that might be a good fit there. I can use my Arden to attach it to an opponent's creature. And then when I move it, grafted war gear says whenever grafted where Kier becomes unattached from a permanent, sacrifice that permanent. Your opponent will not be forced to sacrifice that permanent, and you won't sacrifice it because you can only sacrifice stuff that you control. So no, Infernal Tribute only works on your stuff because you can only sacrifice your stuff. BCH says, hi, demo to your channel. Thank you for the video. I am curious if you can talk about cards that break the stack, such as Garth, One-Eye's ability to cast sorcery spells at instant speed. So it's not exactly breaking the stack, but it is timing restrictions, right? Cards have timing restrictions, sorcery, speed, instant speed, all that kind of stuff. But again, whatever the card says is always going to trump whatever the actual rules are, right? Of course, there's lots of cards out there that will break the typical rules of a commander game. Garth One-Eye, of course, says that you can tap it to cast all those different spells. You are creating a copy of the chosen card and you may cast the copy. And when you do so, you're putting that spell directly on the stack. That's what you do when you copy spells. And of course, some of them are aren't at instant speed, right? A Shivan Dragon, obviously, it's a creature, doesn't have flash, you're typically going to cast that at sorcery speed, but whenever you have an ability that is activated at instant speed, that's going to sort of trump it. So with Garth One-Eye's ability, you can tap this on your opponent's turn and put the Shivan Dragon copy on the stack and cast it, even though you normally wouldn't be able to do it. So the timing restrictions don't apply there. Madness works the exact same way. With Madness, that will trump any typical timing restrictions there. So any madness card that you would typically cast at sorcery speed, the madness is if you would discard this card. So if you discard the card on your opponent's turn or at instant speed to some ability, it will allow you to cast that card for its madness cost, even though you typically wouldn't be able to cast it at that time because it's a sorcery. But the madness is overriding the typical timing restrictions there. Jacob Stone said, in your beginning of upkeep scenarios, say two people have multiple upkeep triggers. You mentioned the person whose turn it is gets to choose the order of their own triggers, but would they also choose the order of the other player's triggers, or would they choose the order of their own triggers after the first player passes priority? I got a couple of questions about this one. Yes, you always choose the order of your own triggers. Even if it is another player's turn, if you have two things that trigger at the beginning of that player's upkeep, or probably more likely, you have two things that trigger when a creature dies, you get to choose the order of your own triggers, even if you're not the active player, even if it's not your turn. So if you have two things that trigger at the beginning of upkeep and your opponent has two things that trigger at the beginning of upkeep. If it's your turn, your two abilities are going to go on the stack first and you will choose the order in which they go on there. Then your opponent's two at the beginning of upkeep triggers will go on the stack after, so they're going to resolve first and because it's their ability, they will choose the order of those as well. So you always get to choose the order of your own triggers. Gaming Mario says, question, if my opponent cast a spell from the graveyard and in response I exile the card from it, what what will happen? I'm not sure. Does my opponent have to spend the mana or does it resolve? And I'm saving this one till last because it's going to play into what I'm talking about today. So I have to use an example here, right? Your opponent's going to cast a spell from a graveyard. Let's say it's with a Snapcaster Mage. It's going to ETB. The ability of the Snapcaster Mage will go on the stack and he's going to have to choose a target. Again, whenever anything says target, you have to choose that.
that target when the ability or spell goes on the stack. And Snapcaster Mage says target instant or sorcery card in your graveyard gains flashback. So that ability goes on the stack. They choose the spell that they want to gain flashback. And at that point, you know what they're targeting in their graveyard and you can exile it in response. Now, if you don't want to do that right away, they now have the ability to cast it. Assuming it's a sorcery and they can't cast it at instant speed, obviously if they can cast it at instant speed, they can do it whenever they want. But if it's a sorcery, because that I think is the more likely scenario here, now they are able to cast that sorcery. So Snapcaster has resolved and that spell in their graveyard now has flashback. They can cast it whenever they want. Again, because it's their turn, assuming it's their turn because they're going to be casting a sorcery, you have no opportunity now to exile that sorcery if you want to. You've already lost your chance, right? When that ability was on the stack, was your opportunity to exile that sorcery in response. Now that it's their turn, they can cast that sorcery before you can do anything. Again, in assuming they're not using the stack at all, you have no opportunity to exile that card in response to them casting it. Once they pay the flashback cost, and yes, they will have to pay the cost, right? Any cost is always going to be paid when something is put on the stack, whether it is a spell or an ability. If you undo something, if it fizzles, if it's countered, the cost is already paid. So there is no way that the cost is not going to get paid in any of these scenarios. They're going to pay the cost for the flashback of that sorcery. And now it's actually on the stack. It is too late for you to exile it from their graveyard. There is no opportunity for you to do anything about it now other than just counter it, right? And that will bring me into the topic of discussion today, which is zones. And it's interesting because the last video I did talking about the stack, I referred to it as an imaginary place. And a guy said, well, it's not actually imaginary. It is an actual zone. And it is. The stack is one of the official zones where things go. But for the most part, it's imaginary. Like in a paper magic game, you don't have a physical place where you put spells and abilities on the stack. It's sort of just kind of existing in the game without actually doing it. Whereas the other zones actually have a physical representation, right? So for example, the library, right? That is one zone. Your hand is another zone. The battlefield, of course. Graveyard. Exile is a zone. And of course, in the commander format, we have the command zone as well. Now, the reason why these zones are important is because every card in a commander game has to exist in one of those zones. Now, of course, we all know how the command zone works. It's pretty simple. You have your commander in there. That is all. Not really a whole lot to talk about there. Everything else is going to be in one of those other zones. Cards can't exist anywhere else. Now, I should talk about outside of the game a little bit, but again, in the commander format, that doesn't really apply, right? Any card that refers to outside of the game obviously will not be in any of those zones. Typically in other formats, that refers to your sideboard, right? If you have a card that says you can go get a card from outside of the game, that means you can go get it from your sideboard. We don't have sideboards in commander, nor do I think that we should. So that means none of those cards really do anything. And no, those cards do not get your commander out of the command zone either. I had a guy comment on one of my videos about this, where he thought the cards that get stuff outside of the game will get stuff from the command zone. And no, they don't get stuff from exile either. Okay. The exile zone is a specific zone and any card referring to exile will refer to that zone. Anything referring to outside of the game does not refer to any of the actual zones in a commander game. It doesn't refer to exile. It doesn't refer to the command zone. It refers to cards completely outside of the game, which again, in commander is not a thing. Now, the most important thing when it comes to zones, again, other than the fact that every card has to exist in one of these zones at any one time, I think the most important thing to talk about here is what cards are when they're in certain zones, okay? So for example, and this is a question I've gotten a few times, a card, whatever that card might be, is only that card when it is on the battlefield, okay? So permanence, obviously. Permanence only exists on the battlefield. You can't have spells on the battlefield like instants and sorceries. Any permanent type, and of course that means creature, artifact, enchantment, land, planeswalker, those types only exist when they're on the battlefield. So an enchantment isn't actually an enchantment until it's on the battlefield. When it's not on the battlefield, it is an enchantment card. So for example, if you look at Academy Rector, it says when Academy Rector dies, you may exile it. If you do search your library for an enchantment card, put that card onto the battlefield, right? Anything that talks about just enchantments has nothing to do with an enchantment in your library, in the graveyard, or in your hand. It only is referring to an enchantment 
enchantment that's on the battlefield because a card is only an enchantment when it's on the battlefield. When it's in any other zone, it is an enchantment card, right? Same goes for any other permanent. If you look at any card that searches for creatures, it will specifically say, search your library for a creature card. You're not searching your library for a creature because it's not a creature till it's on the battlefield. It is a creature card. In your graveyard, it's a creature card. In your hand, it's a creature card, right? Elvish Piper says, pay one green and tap. You may put a creature card from your hand onto the battlefield. That's because in your hand, it isn't a creature. It's a creature card. So it is very important because there's lots of cards like this in the game that refer to creatures or enchantments or planeswalkers, but then ones that refer to creature cards or enchantment cards, right? Whenever you see the word card, following whatever that permanent type is, that means it is in your graveyard, in your library, in your hand, not on the battlefield, right? Same goes for instance and sorceries. You look at Spellseeker, when Spellseeker enters the battlefield, you may search your library for an instant or sorcery card with mana value two or less, right? Now, of course, instance and sorceries don't exist on the battlefield, although I'm sure there is some convoluted way that you can make it happen. Instance and sorceries are always going to be cards unless they're on the stack. That's when they're not not a card any longer. And again, the wording here is really, really important. When an instant or sorcery is on the stack, it now becomes a spell. Everything that refers to a spell, a creature spell, instant and sorcery spell, that is referring to something while it is on the stack, right? This is how counter spells work. You can counter any spell, doesn't affect anything when it's in any other zone. It only affects things when it's on the stack because things are only spells when they are on the stack. So an instant and sorcery spell is a spell that's on the stack. That's not referring to an instant or sorcery in your hand or in your graveyard. Those are instant and sorcery cards. So if you have your eternal witness in your hand, it is a creature card. When you cast it while it's on the stack, it is a creature spell. And when it hits the battlefield, it now officially becomes a creature. And if it dies and goes to your graveyard, it then becomes a creature card. Once again, it's no longer a creature. This is all very important stuff when it comes to interactions with certain cards. It is also very important to note that things will change zones when you cast them because they go on the stack, right? And this can be very important as well. Getting back to that Snapcaster example, whenever you cast something, it goes on the stack. So when you cast that spell from flashback, it's leaving your graveyard, going to the stack, and then it's resolving. Now, in the case of an instant or sorcery, it is actually being cast from your graveyard. So if a a card refers to casting things from your graveyard, you're good to go. However, there are creatures that you can cast from your graveyard. So for example, Hogak, you may cast Hogak from your graveyard. Now, when you cast it from your graveyard, it is not going from your graveyard onto the battlefield, okay? This is not like a reanimator effect where you're putting it directly from graveyard onto the battlefield. Because you're casting it, it's going to leave your graveyard, go onto the stack first because it does become a creature spell, right? You're casting it. Then it's gonna go onto the battlefield once it resolves. Now, this can be very important because there are cards that refer to casting things from graveyard but there are also things that refer to when a creature goes from your graveyard to the battlefield, for example, and this is not doing that, right? If you have a card that says that, Hogak will not trigger it because Hogak is not going from your graveyard to the battlefield. It's going from your graveyard to the stack and then to the battlefield, so you're skipping over there. So that is very important to note as well, right? In any zone, whether it be exile, graveyard, whatever, if you're ever casting a spell from a different zone than it normally would be cast in, it does have have to go to the stack first before it's going to do anything else. Casting is always going to involve the stack, right? So you have to add that step in there because it can be very important. And I'll end off with talking about stuff that refers to specific zones. So let's look at Asmodeus the Archfiend, right? Four black, black, devil god, six, six. If you would draw a card, exile the top card of your library face down instead. So of course, the cards you are drawing are going into that exile zone. You can pay three black and draw seven cards, which of course will put them all into exile because that first ability is going to make sure they do so. And then it says one black return all cards exiled with Asmodeus the Archfiend to owner's hand and you lose that much 
such life. So whenever you have a card, whether it be your commander, a creature, an enchantment, whatever, that is specifically referring to a zone like that, what it means is that Asmodeus is only looking at the cards that he has exiled with this actual existence of Asmodeus, right? So what that means is if I've exiled 20 cards with my Asmodeus and then my opponent bounces it back to my hand and I play it again, he is going to forget about all the cards that have been exiled with him before. This is a new iteration of Asmodeus and now when it says return all cards exiled with Asmodeus to the Archfane to owner's hand, that's not going to return anything because this iteration of Asmodeus has not exiled any cards yet. If you look at a card like Atrata the Silencer, it says when it deals combat damage to a player, exile target creature that player controls and put a hit counter on it, right? And the hit counter thing is not just for flavor, it actually makes a big difference with the rules of this card because it says that player loses the game if they own three or more cards exiled with hit counters on them. It doesn't say exiled with Atrata. It doesn't matter where you got the exiled cards with hit counters on them from. It doesn't have to be from this iteration of Atrata. You could have your Atrata shuffled into your library or bounced to your hand or whatever. All this ability is looking for is cards in exile with hit counters on them, which is why Atrata works so great with Mari the Killing Quill, right? Which says whenever a creature an opponent controls dies, exile it with a hit counter on it. So Atrata's ability is looking for cards in exile with hit counters on it. Doesn't matter how they got there, right? So sometimes cards will refer to certain cards in exile that were exiled with their ability. And that is very important because it gets bounced removed, whatever, especially when it comes to your commander, they will essentially forget about it. But sometimes it doesn't refer to necessarily cards exiled with them, but just cards in exile, right? Riyami, First of the Fallen is another one that works this way. If a non-token creature would die, exile that card with a blood counter on it instead. And again, Riyami doesn't care about cards in exile with abilities that have been exiled with it. What it cares about is a creature card exiled with a blood counter on it. That's all it cares about. So if your Riyami dies, you cast it again. All Riyami is looking for is cards in exile with blood counters on them. It doesn't matter how they got there. So again, a very important distinction when it comes to a lot of commanders in the format. So again, just to reiterate the main points here, you have essentially seven zones. If we include the command zone, that is a zone, library, hand, battlefield, graveyard, stack, and exile. Every card in a commander game or in any magic game has to exist in one of those zones, right? That is the most important takeaway here. So that is it. That is all. Hope that clarified some things for you. You guys i like doing these videos i like answering you guys questions leave some more questions in the comments below that you want me to tackle and if you have some ideas i've had some guys give me ideas for videos talking about zones was an idea that somebody suggested that's why i did this video so if you have some topics that you think i should cover add that in the comments below as well but that is it for today thanks for tuning in